Thank you so much, Melanie, one of the co-authors of the report, and Luis, another co-author, and uh, Emma, uh, a third co-author. And we're so pleased to uh, have you join us today. Our goal is to call your attention to the role that CUNY could play in supporting our students who work in the food industry to win higher wages, better benefits, safer working conditions, and the right to join unions. The report we're discussing today grows out of several years' work at the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. The Institute is a research action center that helps to develop fair, smart, and equitable food policies for New York and other cities. The work we'll present today is based on four key insights. First, the COVID pandemic has had disastrous consequences for New York City's low wage workers. COVID harmed New York City sooner and harder than many other places. And the city's 750,000 food workers experienced higher levels of wage loss, illness and death, and disrupted family life than other sectors. Second, our 2021 survey of a representative sample of CUNY students found that the food sector was the largest single employer of the many students who work to support themselves, their families, and their education. Based on that survey, we estimate that about 40,000 40, CUNY students work part or full-time in the food sector. As you'll hear from Luis, a co-author of this report and one of my brilliant and dedicated public health students, these student food workers face a variety of challenges in combining school, work, and family lives. We hope to enlist all of you in working to make things easier for them. Third, our report recognizes the tremendous opportunity that the new attention to labor organizing, especially in the food sector, brings to CUNY, New York City, and the nation. By educating our students and their, about their rights as workers, by connecting them to the unions and worker organizations that are organizing food delivery workers and other workers at Starbucks, McDonald's, Chipotle, and elsewhere. And by making CUNY a safe space for talking about unions and workers' rights, we can contribute to making New York a healthier and more equitable city. Growing scholarly evidence shows that increasing union representation is a powerful antidote to poverty, ill health, inequality, and threatened democracy. Finally, defining a new role for CUNY in supporting unionization offers an expanded vision of CUNY's historic mission. Like many other universities, in its workforce development, CUNY has emphasized preparing students for the more glamorous and allegedly promising sectors, high tech, finance, STEM, but the pandemic and the last few years has shown that these sectors are as vulnerable as others. Look at all the layoffs at Amazon and uh, some of the other tech companies and uh, vulnerable also to political crises and economic cycles. A more balanced strategy for CUNY might be to look at the foundations of New York City's economy, food, healthcare, education, childcare, arts, entertainment, and hospitality. In this approach, CUNY could ask not only what skills and competencies do employers want from our graduates, but also how can our university contribute to improving working conditions, career ladders, workplace cultures, protection against sexism and racism in ways that make the foundations of our economy better places to work for our graduates and for all New Yorkers. We're excited to share these ideas with you today, and we invite you to join us in the months and years to come in defining CUNY's 21st century role in improving the work lives and career successes of our students. So let's jump in. And Melanie and Luis, I turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much for uh, that overview, Nick. Um, and uh, with no further ado, I will hand things over to Luis, to uh, one of our report co-authors, to tell you a little bit about what we found in our report. So over to you, Luis. Thank you so much for joining. Just bear with me for a minute while I do some screen sharing. Let's go. OK, perfect. Okay, can you see my screen? 
Great. So once again, thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to be presenting on basically what the methodology and findings that led to uh, resulted in the report uh, making CUNY a place to educate and organize New York City food workers a call to action. Uh, so this uh, research was uh, conducted by the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy and by the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. So as we mentioned, uh, the authors of this report um, are Emilia Vignola, uh, she is a doctoral candidate at the CUNY School of Public Health. Uh, Nick, uh, he is a distinguished professor of public health at the School of Public Health. Uh, Melanie Carellis, uh, who is a graduate student at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, and myself, I am also a graduate student at the CUNY School of Public Health. Um, the study uh, which the report is based on was approved by the uh, School of Public Health Institutional Review Board. And let's jump in into the methodology of the of the study. Uh, so essentially, we conducted uh, in-depth semi-structured interviews over Zoom or conference audio. Uh, each of the interviews lasted approximately 45 minutes. Uh, all in all, 20 students from 14 CUNY campuses uh, with experience working in fast food, uh, restaurants, catering, uh, coffee shops, and not based food delivery. Uh, participated in the interviews. Uh, the interviews occurred during the fall of 2021 and spring 22 semesters. Um, and, and on the other, in terms of like key informants um, to get like a different perspective uh, from students, we interviewed a key informants. Uh, we received perspectives from CUNY faculty, CUNY administrators, uh, CUNY and food worker union organizers. Um, Okay, let's go for the next slide. So the findings. Uh, so we, some of the findings can be structured into, at least we structure them in the reports into three different categories. Uh, this is the benefits from working in the food sector. Uh, so again, for most students, uh, the primary drivers for working in food was economic security. Uh, some students lack financial support to either pay for tuition or to support themselves and their families. Uh, other benefits that uh, students derive from working in food, uh, one, the flexibility of, of working in food allow for accommodations of class and personal responsibilities. Uh, for some of the younger students, uh, food work was actually their entryway into the workforce and allowed them to build the skills that could be transferred to other careers. Uh, and then mixing school and work activities brought about feelings of uh, competency, effectiveness, productivities. So it made the, it made students feel, you know, that they could they could take on the world essentially, as one student put it. Um, others saw food work as essential, uh, as valuable, as providing a service to commu to the communities where uh, they worked. Um, and lastly, uh, relationships with their coworkers were like a major positive attribute that. Uh, uh, supported the students in their work. So again, uh, as I mentioned, we the next uh, we structure challenges uh, from combining food work and school. Uh, it's like as another section of the report. So food work, as we I'm sure you all know, uh, is physically demanding. Uh, many of the tasks involved heavy lifting, repetitive motions, leading to injuries, uh, exposures to hot and cold temperatures. Some students had few or no breaks. Uh, they would stand for long periods of time. Uh, and as one student put it, uh, the challenge is the shifts are long and you are on your feet. So physically, I am challenged. Physically, my body is tired. And when my body is tired, it is difficult to focus on school work. Um, so again, uh, not only was the, the the work physically demanding, but also it was also mentally challenging for them as it interfered with their their courses in terms of like completing and their coursework or just their general time management um, issues. Um, I initially mentioned the flexibility was one of the things that students mentioned as like a draw to food work, but the reality. Uh, is that many of the students had little control over the work schedules due to understaffing. Uh, this was primarily driven by COVID. 
Um, other students felt compelled to take on extra shifts or for extra income or because they were pressured from managers. Uh, in some cases, it resulted in some of students missing class <laughs> as a result of this. Um, and then just managing work and class schedules um, left students with little time to socialize, to participate in extracurricular activities or events at school. Uh, so there was a disconnect between students' uh, uh, connection to, to on campus. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like the little, you know, the shifts are long, uh, work is physically demanding, uh, students with life with little energy, um, and this interfere with their ability to keep up with schoolwork. Uh, so more challenges. Um, students uh, express stress and difficulty in meeting managers' high expectations. Uh, their students uh, felt uh, a lack of power in their relationships with managers. Um, and then in terms of like interactions with like uh, unruly aggressive customers, that was like a deep uh, core uh, source of like uh, stress um, and, and in, in the students' lives. Um, and being unable to defend and, and protect themselves against sexual harassments from customers as well as coworkers and managers was uh, deeply uh, a core issue for that was a daily um, uh, experience for, not a daily experience, but it was a, a core experience for these students working in food. Um, and then access to benefits. Uh, so access to benefits like paid sick leave or health insurance or pay time off. Um, so. Most students were not informed about basic leave policies. And when they were informed, uh, some of them did not know how to access uh, their, you know, the, 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 the basic leave, or some of them were unsure about whether they were eligible or uh, the way that basic leave is accrued was poorly explained to them. So they did not know how to use it. A uh, few of the students were offered paid time off um, and other benefits such as tuition reimbursement. But even when they when it was off it offered, um, a lot of the students faced bureaucratic barriers. Um, uh, for instance, in, for one company, uh, tuition reimbursement was offered, but uh, they need students needed to meet like a specific number of hours to 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 in order to get that uh, benefit, but obviously because of class and other responsibilities, they could not meet those hours. Um, and again, for those students that did not have any paid sick leave, uh, they had no choice but to work while sick or you know, risk uh, uh, lose their income uh, or just in general, like face retaliation from um, their, their managers, bosses. Now, some of the now now we go to like the positive. Uh, how do you you know deal with like the challenges you face at work? Um, and I will say that like the students were remarkably like uh, just empowered uh, by uh, by their coworkers and 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 by looking into strategies that you know figuring things out that for themselves for one instance like or ideas of like or powering through things. Um, and then tolerating things with the like, support of coworkers. Again, coworkers were like a major positive attribute that supported the students in, in, some, in dealing with the challenges that they experienced. Uh, some students did seek help from managers, but oftentimes it led to no changes in their situation. Uh, for other, for a few students, uh, some of them knew of their legal worker protections and did leverage them. Um, and then in terms of like interactions with unions, very few students reported uh, interactions with unions. Uh, some of their comments range from, you know, they had limited awareness of the role of unions. Uh, others believed unions to be essential to ensuring workers are protected against abuses. Uh, others expressed interest in becoming involved or if it could help them and, and others. Um, and this is one of the quotes from one of the students. Um, a lot of workers don't have unions, so it would be really helpful to have an info session on workers' rights, especially there are some managers and there are some bosses who are terrible. Even though they are informed about workers' rights, they don't respect it, and they know their workers are desperate for a job. So, uh, you know, we took on the, based on, on, on the challenges and just the general experience of like CUNY students working in food, we uh, are proposing uh, several recommendations to different stakeholders 
uh, such as CUNY, uh, unions and labor organizations, employers, and city and state policymakers. I'm just going to read you the, in the general intent of the uh, uh, recommendations that we're proposing. There are several <laughs> recommendations for each of the stakeholders that you can read in the report. But in terms of CUNY, um, we uh, are asking for an expansion of labor rights education and assistance on workplace rights and protections. Uh, in terms of the unions and labor organizations, we are asking for more active partnerships with CUNY to nurture labor rights education and organizing. Uh, for employers, we are asking for employers who actively support working students by communicating, communicating labor laws, respecting the right to organize, and offering decent wages and good benefits. Uh, and for city and state policymakers, we are asking to for the expansion and for strengthening policies that protect workers um, and policy that close the gap between the state's uh, wealthiest and poorest residents. So something like the New Deal for CUNY would address one of the core challenges that uh, students face, which is economic security to like pay for tuition. So thank you. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any suggestions, please feel free to uh, send us a comment. Here's like the link where you can go into, and we will also drop this in the chat. So let me just stop sharing. Great. Uh, and thank you so much, Luis, for going over the report. Again, as we've uh, uh, dropped a few times into the chat now, uh, you can uh, check out the report in more detail uh, uh, to see more of our recommendations. So uh, it is my extreme pleasure to uh, move us ahead into our panel um, and to talk a little bit about, you know, not only some of uh, what we found in our research and in our conversation with these uh, CUNY students who work in the food sector, but uh, thinking about the ways that, again, the CUNY community can uh, start uh, moving towards uh, some of the recommendations uh, that we brought forward in this report. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, do a couple of introductions to uh, some of our great panelists today. Um, the way that the panel will work is I'll do uh, introductions to each of our panelists, uh, and then we'll move into uh, a brief panel where each of them will have about five minutes uh, to talk about how their work intersects with some of what we're talking about here today. Uh, and then we'll move into questions from the audience. So again, reminding folks to use that Q&A function you see at the bottom uh, of our screen here today. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd love to introduce our esteemed panelists today. First, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Council Member Tiffany Caban uh, from the 22nd District uh, here in New York City. Uh, Council Member Caban was born in Richmond Hills, Queens to Puerto Rican parents who grew up in Woodside houses. Uh, before she joined uh, the New York City Council, uh, Tiffany worked as a public defender, representing people who did not have resources to defend themselves against the brutal system of mass incarceration. Throughout her career, she has used the law to help New York City's most vulnerable communities, and her experiences advocating on behalf of her clients uh, have helped her identify some of the worst inequities in our criminal justice system. Um, so again, very excited to have you on here today, Council Member Caban. Uh, we're also joined today by Jeremy Espinal, uh, an organizer with uh, SEIU Local 32 BJ. Uh, Jeremy is a lifelong New Yorker and Bronx native who attended CUNY's Hunter College uh, uh, from 2017 to 2021 while working at Chipotle. Jeremy quickly became a worker leader within his store after learning about 32BJ's fast food campaign. Uh, and some of his interest in labor organizing started early as both of his parents are union members. He considers it a great honor now to work for his father's union, organizing the fast food industry to raise working standards for food service workers. So thank you, Jeremy, for joining us today. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Stephanie Luce. Uh, professor Luce is a professor of labor studies at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Her research focuses on low wage work globalization and labor standards, as well as labor and community coalitions. Uh, she is the author of Labor Movements, uh, Global Perspectives. She's uh, well known for her research on living wage campaigns and movements, um, and has authored uh, a number of publications around that issue, including uh, Fighting for a Living Wage and co-authoring The Living Wage, Building a Fair Economy. Uh, Professor Luce has also published numerous reports on labor and wages in the New York City area 
including the annual State of the Union report co-authored with Ruth Milkman. So again, welcome, Professor Luce. And then we also are joined today by uh, Jack Pelicano, a CUNY Law student, uh, getting close to being a CUNY Law graduate. So uh, early congratulations there. So Jack has worked in food service in New York City for more than a decade. Jack's search for long-term healthcare access led them to CUNY Law, where they are a third year student focused on supporting worker-owned cooperatives and small businesses in New York City. So again, welcome Jack, thank you for joining us. And finally, last but certainly not least, uh, I'm happy to introduce Andrea Vasquez. Uh, Andrea is the Associate Director of the American Social History Project, in the Center for Media and Learning, and Managing Director of the CUNY Graduate Center's New Media Lab. Uh, she works with a team of producers and historians to create classroom documentaries and U.S. history web resources. Um, and she, her own recent work uh, is directing the ongoing CUNY Digital History Archive. We'll drop links uh, to that work in the chat shortly. Andrea is also the first vice president of PSC CUNY. For over 15 years, she's worked to organize higher education officers across CUNY. She's also served on the PSC Executive Council for several terms and in the last two rounds of bargaining on the Negotiations Committee. She is leader in the legislation work of the PSC and spearheads the, uni uh, the union's coalition work with the CUNY Rising Alliance and other unions and community groups. Uh, she was introduced uh, instrumental in the creation of the New Deal for CUNY legislation uh, that was filed in early 2021 and she works on the campaign for funding uh, CUNY and to make sure that bill passes. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and a reminder again for folks who are joining us uh, to please uh, put any questions that you have in the chat in the Q&A function and we will get to those um, uh, later in this conversation. So with no further ado, I'd love to get things started. Uh, so Jack, I'd like to begin with you. As I mentioned uh, in your bio, you worked in the food service for 10 years, including now as a law student at the CUNY School of Law. Uh, what drew you to that work? And how did your working in conditions impact your decision to enroll in CUNY? And how do they impact your education now that you're enrolled? Well, hi there. Thanks for uh, having me. I'll just, I'll dive right in. So. Um, what drew me to the work, I think, is probably different from what kept me in it for 10 years, but what drew me initially is essentially what's um, shown in your report, the flexibility, um, the availability of the work as an 18-year-old uh, starting out, um, and the fact that, you know, the, the coffee shop I started at was right next to my school. Um, it really was uh, all driven by that and the, the need for work. I mean, I got into school and just realized very quickly that living in New York City, uh, is going to school at the new school and taking on those student loans was not something I was going to be able to do without working. Um, and so that started me there. What kept me in it was a number of things, but largely was my mounting student debt um, and just the understanding that I was making the money and um, the ability to go and get an entry level job um, where, you know, just with a bachelor's degree was going to pay me less than what I was making, um, making tips. And so I stayed, I stayed for years and um, tried to make a, you know, a career out of it. Of course, the, the caveat with that is at a time when there wasn't a lot of um, union organizing, especially in coffee shops then, very happy to see it happening across the board now. Um, I took on jobs that paid me more and gave me more hour stability, which led me to management, was a which was a place that I just found untenable. Um, and so, being in a position where my values were so often compromised, especially after decades, a decade of working places, various, many, 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 probably couldn't even think and name all the coffee shops I've worked in New York City, all the places I've catered, um, the amount of workers' rights violations, labor violations that were just so common, I just couldn't be in a place of management. I couldn't find that. Uh, I couldn't make my future there. Just wasn't for me. Um, and after a number of pretty significant workplace injuries, um, I decided that I need to focus on finding health insurance and finding that stability somewhere. Um, and so that is what drew me to CUNY Law. I was lucky enough to find an excellent program where I could mesh all of these values um, and focus on worker ownership and worker co-ops, which I think is uh, something that really excites me, especially seeing a lot of small food businesses in the city. Um, and so that is that is how my working conditions impacted my decision to enroll. 
how they impacted my time while enrolled is uh, pretty similar to undergrad, I would say. You know, I worked for the first year and a half of law school at a, at a cafe, um, which was the first, it was 2020, 2021 of the pandemic, pre, uh, pre-vaccines, pre which I would say is probably the, uh, was like the hardest year I spent working in food service for sure. Um, and like I said, in undergrad, it just very quickly, school was not my priority. Um, I think it was very, you know, as is shown throughout your uh, report for most CUNY students, school is probably not even able to be the second priority um, with family and other commitments. And um, it was great to be able to be virtual, but that also led me to taking a lot of shifts that were during the day um, and joining Zoom class while I was working. Um, and that that really was uh, the impact on my education there. And then finally, I had to leave again, food service because of an injury uh, caused by needing to change the setup of a cafe because of COVID. Um, essentially, we, you know, did what we could with the space. I think what a lot of people were doing during COVID, um, but it just wasn't right for a lot of people's bodies. Because again, you're working with small spaces, small food businesses in New York City. You don't have a lot of space to work with, trying to keep everyone safe. Um, and so, yeah, eventually I ended up um, with a pretty significant shoulder injury um, and luckily was able to take care of it because of Medicaid and having that access to PT um, because of being a student. But um, otherwise, that, that, that was the impact. Largely, it is a place that I often find um, is a home. Um, my coworkers have become um, and largely we're always family. And I, I found so much solidarity with the people that I worked with in, um, in food service in New York City. And it's a place I uh, do occasionally and probably continue to, will continue to even as a lawyer, uh, dip back into um, the availability of taking shifts for the necessary pay to pay the bills. That flexibility has been a huge, uh, huge part of my, my involvement with the food service industry. Well, thank you, Jack. And um, again, appreciate you talking through, um, you know, your own journey when it comes to food work and balancing that with school, both in undergrad and now uh, at the CUNY School of Law. Um, and I'll move us over to Jeremy, uh, who also has some experience uh, navigating food work while enrolled at CUNY. Uh, Jeremy, your union, 32BJ, has played a critical role in winning some really big, important victories for food workers in the last five years. And so uh, for the folks in the room, I wonder if you could describe uh, what have some of those wins been and how does that benefit uh, college students and other food workers? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for introducing me, Melanie. Thank you for having me on the panel. Um, I'd like to start off that all the victories I'm gonna be talking about um, have belonged to and have been won by fast food workers. And I'm proud to say that I was a part of that and a part of that group. Um, but I can only talk about it because of the workers that fought hard for it. Um, the fast food campaign grew out of um, the original Five for 15 that got us to the $15 minimum wage um, 10 years ago. Um, it started with McDonald's workers going on strike um, in those years that won us that minimum wage. Um, and in the more recent years, um, in 2017, the Fair Work Week laws were passed that protect um, fast food worker schedule and is meant to give them um, predictable, um, sustainable schedules. Um, by taking their availability and giving that schedule to them week to week um, and facilitating a, a, a way where worker, if they, workers have their availability changed, they can bring that up to their employers and have their schedules changed because of that. Um, in 2021, um, a just cause law was passed here in New York that essentially eliminates at will employment and makes it a thing of the past for fast food workers. Um, fast food workers, because of just cause, are protected um, in being fired unfairly, in that the company has to follow certain procedures, um, giving write ups and warnings before they can just terminate a worker. Um, obviously, in egregious cases, the company holds the right to fire workers, but in most cases, um, workers are protected. Um, and most recently, just last year, um, we helped win a historic settlement of $20 million for, for around 13,000 
Chipotle workers, uh, previously and currently employed, um, and partly due, be, due to the company not following the Fair Work Week laws that were passed in 2017. Um, so it's still a battle to today to make this company follow um, fair, the Fair Work Week laws. Um, and that's why I think it's so important um, to get fast food workers a union, not only Chipotle workers, but all fast food workers a union, because it will make it so that they don't have to be so reactive in suing the company, you know, because these laws that protect them are there, they would be able to get in front of it um, by having that contract. Um, and that would benefit students the most by, you know, creating that stability and having them be able to provide for themselves. Excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. And we'll go uh, into some of those in more detail as we go along, but appreciate that overview. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand uh, things over to Council Member Caban. Uh, Council Member, um, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Jeremy outlined victories that have been won by New York City's food workers, uh, including um, some of those victories that have been won through city legislation. So how can New York City's government build on some of those victories and expand, uh, expand workplace protections for the city's working class? Yeah, for sure. Um, just, just first of all, thank you for having me. It's awesome to be part of the conversation, especially with um, students on the panel and, and also just Jack Godspeed in your, your remaining time in law school. <laughs> Um, but I, I think back to my days and under I was an undergrad at Penn State and I was a, a worker at an on campus deli making you know wraps and, and sandwiches and was in that job for exactly the same reasons that you said Jack. Um, so yeah, we have had some great wins uh, and I'm going to kind of end with you know the the just cause bill for fast food workers and how we are looking to expand that. Um, but start from being really honest with y'all that th there is a lot that the city council can do in terms of, um, you know, pro worker legislation. And we have not really risen to the occasion over the past, like first year of, um, of this iteration of, of the council, but we are making progress, which is exciting and good. Um, you know, recently we have introduced to date and I'm a, a proud co-sponsor of uh, a couple of bills. It's a, a two bill package led by council members Velasquez and De La Rosa to strengthen key aspects of the, the fair work week law, um, which I think is really big, really important. Um, and then uh, Council Member Menon uh, introduced legislation to deliver a greater hospital accountability. Um, and there's a bill by De Deputy Speaker Ayala to create a, a right to recall for certain service workers. Uh, so these are like the different pieces of legislation that would strengthen workers' rights across the city and across sectors. Um, and we also uh, ended up supporting the, the passage of a bill by Council Member De La Rosa to encourage greater diversity within civil service titles and, and co-chair here and with her to examine uh, gender diversity in, in the trades. Um, one thing that has not been introduced yet, but I am the, the prime sponsor of and we should be introducing soon, is a, a, a bill that we're working on with the Teamsters to uh, license last mile delivery warehouse, warehouses with worker standards and hopefully to get that draft from the Council's Legislative uh, Division soon. Um, have taken a stand just on principle as a council passing a resolution um, that I sponsored, uh, basically blasting anti-democratic union busting activity and expressing solidarity with new union organizing in the city. Um, and you know, one thing that we're we're also internally having a bit of a battle on is uh, legislation that would explore uh, banning captive audience uh, meetings. I'm not the the first in fit. Uh, first in time on that legislation, uh, Council Member Powers holds that, but there's an, an internal discussion on whether that is to get a little bit wonky, whether that it has to be a resolution or it can be introduced as, um, you know, a, a bill, uh, which would be preferable. Uh, there, there talks about whether it's preempted by state law um, and for, you know, the folks that are in the legal field, uh, legal analysis is not a science, um, you know, it depends on who's on the bench, uh, what the, what the political environment is, different analysis by, by, you know, different, differently qualified legal, um, experts. So there's continued discussion going there and then just building on the success that was the, the just cause protections for fast food workers, you know, here where I represent, um, in Astoria, uh, we had a worker named Austin at our Ditmars Boulevard Starbucks that was fired um, and 
got his job back uh, because of the just cause law for fast food workers. And so we've seen it work well. Um, DC, DCWP seems to be you know, working well on that front. Although, and I'll get to this later, they need a lot more capacity, a lot more resources. Um, and uh, you know, I think that what we're looking to do or what we are trying to do is I introduced a universal just cause bill. So it's a secure jobs act and we would take that, those incredible protections that we know are working and dispelled all of the rumors and lies that big corporations told, right? It didn't, it didn't increase unemployment. It didn't drive fast food businesses out of the city. In fact, we saw unprecedented growth in, in the sector after um, the bill was passed. And so taking that, uh, debunking those, those myths and saying all workers deserve this and really strengthening um, it in this iteration. So it has the main components of the Fast Food Workers Just Cause bill, but adds you know, a couple different additional um, avenues of enforcement. So it alleviates some of the pressure on DCWP so that we're not relying just there. It gets the comptroller's office involved. It allows for private rights of, of action um, it expands and increases uh, protections around electronic surveillance that we're seeing in more jobs in more sectors um, so that those can't be used for the purpose of termination or, or, or discipline. Um, and so, you know, we're just trying to build the, the coalition on that front. So I think, you know, that is, there's a lot going on and that's where we're, we're moving. And the fast food workers bill has definitely ignited a lot of fire and hope uh, around being able to expand similar protections for all workers. Excellent. And just on a follow up question there, uh, I know for workers who may be covered by a union contract, for instance, uh, they might be familiar with uh, what just cause uh, means, but for folks who have never uh, been a union member, who have never been a workplace that has those protections, they might not be familiar with it. So I was wondering, before we get too more uh, into that, if you uh, would describe a little bit uh, about what just cause means, uh, you know, in the day to day lives of workers across the city. Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. I, I, um, I should have led with that. Um, it's a protection that is enjoyed by <laughs> countries around the world, and we do not have it here um, as a blanket protection in the United States. But it, and, and most people don't even realize that they're not protected in this way. But it just simply means that before you can be fired, your boss has to give you notice um, and has to give a written reason. Um, and the way that this legislation is written is that in addition to having notice and a written reason, um, you know, there has to be a, a process. So it implements a progressive disciplinary system, uh, which is good for employers and employees and says, hey, you have to note that there's a problem. You have to, you know, kind of give support and give opportunity to improve. And you have to give notice and, uh, you know, a written reason before you you terminate. And it's, it, it seems common sense and pretty simple. And it's because it is. Excellent. We'll get more into that later, but uh, appreciate that overview. Um, thank you again, Councilmember Kaban. Um, and then I'd like to hand things over to uh, Professor Luce. So, uh, Stephanie, we've talked today about um, you know the importance of educating workers on their rights in the workplace. Uh, some of the interviews that we did for this report really highlight. Uh, the fact that uh, a lot of uh, there may be a lot of CUNY students out there who are interested in unions but don't really know sort of the first step and how to get sort of more involved in, in workplace organizing. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes unions uh, play that role of educating workers. Uh, but what we're curious about are how can other organizations, uh, such as, you know, colleges like CUNY, how can, uh, you know, schools like CUNY do some of that labor education? Uh, and what roles have colleges and schools uh, played in the past to educate students about uh, their rights in the workplace? Yeah, thanks, Melanie. Um, yeah, it's fascinating when you think about how almost every college has a school of business, uh, a school of economics, in which uh, students learn how to maximize profit and how to uh, abide by the principles of the free market. Um, but very few schools offer training on worker rights or worker organizing. Um, it's a shocking discrepancy um, when you think about it in that way. But when you go back historically, um, a number of universities, uh, what we call land grant universities, um, did in fact establish uh, what we call labor edge labor extension programs. And the idea here was that they were public institutions and that they had a public mission to help workers um, gain education, both to further their own careers and uh, get jobs and so forth, but also to learn some of the basics uh, about labor issues and worker rights. Um, but a lot of those programs are 
are small and underfunded. Some have been shut down over time, um, and they're constantly under attack, uh, political attack or resource attack. Um, CUNY does have a School of Labor and Urban Studies. It actually became a, the 25th school of CUNY um, just a few years back. And so it's its own standalone school, and that's really exciting. Um, but uh, what the School of Labor and Urban Studies does is offer um, a bachelor's degree in labor studies, a master's degree, as well as certificate programs at the undergrad and graduate level. Um, and uh, there's lots of educational opportunities that are even non-credit um, conferences and workshops and things like that that occur at the school. Um, but, you know, it is interesting because I think a lot of people, um, as Council Member Kavan said, a lot of people don't even realize that they don't have these rights. Um, I find students are often shocked to learn that you actually give up rights when you walk through the door of their, the employer. Like you lose things like freedom of speech. You lose things like the right to a fair trial, unless there's legislation or a union contract in place that gives you some of those rights back. Um, and so I think the first step is even just um, generating the idea that um, you know, we should be paying attention as CUNY, we should be paying attention to the fact that most students are working. Um, most students have not received this kind of education in their K through 12 system. A um, few places have, and um, you know, some of the schools do and, and, and provide that, but it's not systemic. Um, and that it should be uh, you know, fundamental, not just at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, but interwoven throughout um, the curriculum in gen ed courses, it should count towards your gen ed degrees, pathways courses to be able to learn about workers' rights, labor history. Um, this is a really foundational part of our country's history and our daily working lives. Um, and I would love to see, um, you know, the non-credit opportunities and workshops are great, but students also, you know, they're working full time and stretched. And it's, it's also great to think about ways that they get credit for um, taking classes that help them learn about their uh, working conditions and their rights. And of course, just knowing your rights is one thing. Um, the rights are very frequently not enforced and workers may be afraid of retaliation. They may not wanna act alone. It usually comes with knowledge of how to organize, not just knowing the law, but how to organize and insist on those rights um, to, in order to achieve them. So that's what CUNY is also our, our program at the School of Labor and Studies. It's, it's labor law, but it's also issues in organizing. Um, it's issues about globalization and jobs. It's seeing how workers can build power in a much broader sense. Absolutely. Thank you again uh, for that overview and talking about, um, you know, again, how labor education can and uh, should be part of, uh, you know, education, whether at K-12 or, you know, here at college uh, or in colleges like CUNY. Um, and I'm also a uh, proud student of the CUNY School of Labor. So if folks ever have questions about that, I'm always happy to talk about uh, my experience at uh, the program. Um, moving us along, Andrea, uh, I would like to bring you into the conversation today. So PSC CUNY, uh, the Professional Staff Congress, uh, the union representing uh, 30,000 faculty and staff at CUNY um, is, uh, you know, a, a huge institution. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the shared interest between PSC uh, and some of the CUNY students uh, working in food that we've been talking about today. Yes, thanks. Um, so great to be here. Uh, it's such an important report. I guess I want to thank everyone uh, who worked on that report and Luis for the terrific presentation. Um, and I, coming right after Council Member Caban, I also want to applaud her and the other council members who have uh, been fighting valiantly against really potentially devastating cuts that would affect CUNY and so many other institutions um, and agencies across the city. Um, so, and I also want to say I should have had this in my bio. I am a born and bred New Yorker. I am a graduate of Hunter College. I attended college as a, a returning student, uh, as a mom, and as a full-time worker um, when I was there. And it took me a while, but that's where I got my degree from. So, and I guess as someone uh, born and raised in New York, I really understand deeply through many generations of my family the role that CUNY plays in New York and it, um, it, I feel really proud to have been a, to hear about the work that, that you guys are doing. And I think there is, it demonstrates an incredible potential. Um, some of that potential is around the possibilities of coalition. 
and expanding on the kinds of things that Stephanie Luce just described about what CUNY can do. And there's so much happening in classrooms already, so much more can happen, um, but there are so many organizations, there are so many groups that are working to help CUNY students. And it's, it's key. Um, you did describe, Melanie, some, you know, who, the, who this union is, but we're a union that not only fights for those 30,000 member, uh, members who are in so many different titles, we even represent more than a thousand graduate students at CUNY, right? So those are students who we, we actually directly represent. Um, but um, but we, 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 we deal with students and our role in our union is like when we fight for our contract, we think about our students. When we fight, I just came back from Albany, as you know, when we, when we fight for funding for CUNY, we're thinking about our students and the needs are just tremendous. Uh, the devastation has been you know, huge over for many decades. Um, we've been losing ground and it's really pretty tragic given the potential that CUNY has. If you see what students accomplish um, with under, being underfunded and underserved, um, just imagine the success and the economic development and the, you know, the, fight, the, fight, the fight against poverty that really CUNY can respond to. So I guess um, it was kind of one thing. Um, so um, I mean, one thing I want to say in response to Luisa's report, which you know I felt kind of like, wow, that's devastating, is that students who are needing so many more supports here at CUNY, right? I mean, that's why we fought for and created New Deal for CUNY, right? The lack of academic advisors, the lack of mental health counselors, the paltry food pantries that we have. There is so, there is so much need. Um, and it was interesting for me to hear that 40,000 students who are going to college to build their future, find out who they are, find out who they want to become, are finding their closest relationships in fast food jobs. In fast food jobs. What is college about? What is college about if not about building relationships? And so that was a pretty, um, and that's a very powerful thing for us to hear, right? So I think it not only, obviously we, I think what we're learning here today is we can, um, we can help students more in their work lives, you know, not just in their academic lives, in their work lives, we're agreeing that we can, but I think, you know, for people to succeed, for young people to, to move forward, they need relationships and, CUNY is um, falling behind on that front. COVID had a lot to do with it, but I think it's a, it's a real warning that if we don't remember that college, there should be a college experience that should center around building relationships, then um, you know, CUNY will be a shell of itself before too long. And so I think things like seeing online learning as the great savior for everything is a real problem. It's a particular problem for our students who have a lot of learning challenges and life challenges. So um, I think that uh, those are the things that we need to keep in mind, that we need to support students, not only in the ways that we have in our union through New Deal for CUNY, but I think what we're saying here is in their work lives. And, um, and I think that that will require even more partnering and more Kind of coalition work together, uh, and I, I think I, I think there's a tremendous amount of potential, and I look forward to doing that. So thanks. Thank you so much, Andrea. And uh, agree. I think one of the things that came out very clear in this report is, um, you know, I think sometimes students feel when it comes to their food work or you know working in the coffee shop or whatever, it's it's seen as sort of the separate thing or a stepping stone. Um, you know, to the next big thing while you're in school. And for some that may be true, but for a lot of other students, um, including many that we talked to in this report, that wasn't the case. It was, it was, a, it was a community. We had uh, a student mention that, you know, during COVID they felt, you know, in ways prouder than ever to be doing the work that they did uh, because you saw how important institutions like your neighborhood coffee shop or your favorite restaurant or whatever is in making people feel connected. And so um, I think that relationship piece is, is really key and it, it you know draws into question some of the ideas that we have about, you know, what is college for? It's, it's to get you that 
high paying job afterwards that, you know, everyone has to have, um, you know, there's, there's other ways to think about that. And, you know, it was one of the things that motivated us in uh, some of the interviews uh, and writing the report. Um, I wanted to move over uh, to uh, some uh, questions uh, that we have from folks. Um, first, uh, Jeremy, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, thinking about your time at Hunter, now as an organizer at 32BJ, uh, first of all, I'm curious if you've been, if you've encountered food workers who are, uh, you know, also CUNY students in any of your campaigns. Um, and also, you know, what kind of outreach strategies by unions uh, might be effective when it comes to, uh, you know, making some contact and connection with CUNY students who are working in that sector? Um, thanks, Melanie. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, even when I was organizing as a worker student, um, a lot of my coworkers were fellow CUNY students, um, a lot more coming from CUNY's community colleges from across the city, um, but still the issues we faced were still the same and the issues that they're currently facing are still very similar. Um, and a lot of that has to do with um, what affects them most at school is the schedules. Um, even with the Fair Work Week laws being passed in, uh, um, previously, um, a lot of fast food companies still aren't um, abiding by those laws and not give, so they aren't, they're not giving students their schedules in time or really respecting their availability. Um, I mean, me, myself, I saw that with Alton having to miss class, how you mentioned your interviewers also had to miss as well. Um, and that goes into um, them feeling like they're not being paid enough for the work that they're doing. So on top of not getting sufficient hours to sustain themselves, the pay that they're getting isn't enough to, um, to do that either. Um, and thankfully with um, 32 BJ is working right now with the raise the wage campaign to hopefully raise the wage to 21, 25 and index it to inflation. Um, but I think um, CUNY being able to facilitate conversations where workers, where students are coming together and talking with themselves, amongst themselves, about what they can do um, to get these things in their workplace um, and be proactive about it instead of just having to wait necessarily for lawmakers um, to, to fulfill those needs. Um, I think that's something big that CUNY could do, um, especially as, as college or universities being um, a place to build relationships. I think in promoting those relationships and promoting conversations about talking where workers are working, what's going on in these workplaces um, and having these conversations because that's how organizing happens it's through building conversation, building relationships. Um, so I think that is something that CUNY could do whether it be through workshops or just having um, more areas where students can congregate during breaks or in between classes where um, um, they can have these conversations um, as well as teaching students um, more history about it. While it's great that we do have a labor college, I'll say in my personal experience, um, I saw a lot of history classes offered about you know other ethnicities, other cultures, but I honestly don't remember ever seeing anything about labor history um, even if I, even though I had an interest in that as a, a worker organizer. So I think maybe just in general offering those kinds of classes to workers to educate them on their history, on that history, um, would be a lot. Um, but those are some things that came to mind. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, in our report, we do talk about a little bit about where some of that labor history education uh, is happening at CUNY, but you know, uh, as folks who may be familiar with the system knows, it's a big, huge system um, with lots of different things happening. So depending on what campus you are, you might have you know, no idea about uh, some of these classes that are offered elsewhere. So I think it's you know, more, all the more reason to think system-wide. Um, I saw that uh, Jennifer Almanzar had a question and wanted to unmute. So uh, Luis, I don't know if you're able to help Jennifer unmute there for their question. Um, but Jennifer, if you're available, you can go ahead and ask. 
Hi everyone. No, I didn't have a question. I'm I'm here with One Fair Wage. We're a national um, organization seeking to improve wages and working conditions of more than 14 million workers. So we, we work with tip workers that have often been left behind of the minimum wage fight. And I'm I'm gonna share two links with you guys on the chat if I can, or Nick will, about becoming a member and of upcoming Albany action we have going on. Thank you. Great. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what uh, that action in Albany is? Yeah, so we're gonna have a we're gonna take over the war room in Albany um, on May eighth, and basically it's um, because they're passing the twenty one dollars minimum wage, but they're leaving behind tip worker. Oh, sorry. Great. Well, uh, feel free to uh, drop those into the chat, or I see Nick already has. If folks are more interested in hearing about that, but again, thank you for joining us. Um, Building on some of what Jeremy was talking about, uh, Jack, I was wondering, you know, given some of your experience as a food service worker and now CUNY student yourself, um, what are some of the actions that you think CUNY could be taking in terms of thinking about that connection between your working conditions uh, and how you show up in school? Just a small question there. Um, I think I have a laundry list, but uh, I'll try to get to a few. I think like addressing the reasons why a lot of folks work through school. So, I mean, everyone comes to it from a myriad. Some of the biggest expenses of my life are, you know, food, uh, therapy. Um, so having more robust mental health um, support throughout school. And as far as food goes, I mean, you know, we don't have a... Um, there was a there used to be a contract with Single Stop for helping folks get enrolled in SNAP, um, but that uh, was terminated during the pandemic, and um, enrollment has taken over by certain resource centers at certain schools, but isn't is spotty across the board. And on top of that, um, HRA doesn't really know what to do with college students, and a lot of times is not um, equipped to help college students get SNAP, though college students are eligible for sure. Um, and so, yeah, better uh, better services for students getting people in SNAP. CUNY has a list of who is eligible, right, based on um, certain guidelines from SNAP. Um, and on top of that, food pantries with fresh food. I mean, just just answering kind of the basics of why people are working uh, through school, which is mostly to you know make ends meet. Um, in addition to that, higher pay for student workers, you know, I could have taken a student working job during the pandemic and been home, right, and been safer, um, but the pay was at least $6 less an hour, um, and that just, that it just wasn't a possibility, and especially for, I think, for undergrad workers, you know, I've had 10 years of experience in the food industry, which I personally count as professional experience, um, for undergrad workers, the ability to get that experience working at CUNY, there's so many places you can work at CUNY, so many incredible professors doing awesome work, um, but people shouldn't have to take that choice um, at, at, you know, at the, the detriment of uh, being able to make ends meet. And I think in addition to that, for some of the food service workers or folks that I've seen who come from a, a you know, number of years in food service, uh, reaching out to those students when you're getting into professional programs, when you're going into professional workplace environments, um, on how to essentially talk about your time in food service. First, food service is incredibly dynamic work. Um, going into legal service work, especially the kind of uh, legal service we work we mostly prioritize at CUNY, which is free legal services. 10 years in customer service was me working with clients. It was me, um, you know, learning how to de-escalate a lot, you know, a lot of spaces, especially coffee shops function largely as public space in New York City. Um, and so really I've talked to other students who, ha who have not gotten that guidance from the school on how to talk about that work. I was told in an interview that I didn't have any professional working experience um, after, you know, having a 10 plus year um, go at working in food service in New York. So I think that that's also an important part, just recognizing the value in the work, not making people feel like there hasn't been a uh, value. I honestly think that, you know, the problem solving skills, the ability to think on your feet, um, and again, working with people, the EQ necessary to work in food service, um, all of those things should be celebrated and students who have that experience should get the guidance and how to use that to take whatever next steps that they want. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, no, again, and I think a lot of what you're saying was reflected in uh, the conversations that we had in this report, right? Folks saying very similar things of when they met with folks to talk about sort of their next career steps is, you know, 
people looking at like that full first page of the resume and saying, well, that doesn't really apply to, you know, these office jobs or whatever else you might be applying to here and, and feeling like, you know, that that experience wasn't was somehow translated into into nothing, even though it was years and years of work with all sorts of uh, really important skills developed. So um, just wanted to underscore some of what you shared there. Um, Council member Caban, um, you know, I think it's come up a couple of times, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, funding for CUNY, right, um, and talking about things like, you know, funding food pantries and making sure there's mental health services. And, um, you know, we've also talked to during this call about, uh, you know, some of the possibilities with other city agencies like the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections about making sure that people know about some of these rights that uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier in the call that folks like fast food workers have uh, won. And so uh, I know uh, Andrea already mentioned the ongoing state uh, budget negotiations, but we know that the city budget um, is coming up as well. And so um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, some of the issues we're talking today in the context of the city budget, what's going on there and, and what needs to be done to support um, some of these efforts, uh, you know, to strengthen outreach uh, at DCWP and to to strengthen um, some of these services offered by CUNY. Yeah, um, to start really broadly, we need a large scale, um, you know, diverse coalitional effort to create the kind of public political environment that makes it uh, politically unviable to defund all of these things that we know make us safer, make us healthier, provide for dignified workplaces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think that um, in my mind, when I, in order to achieve a, a care economy, right, um, it really requires one, the city to create uh, and, and adequately support a workforce that meets the city's needs, which does not exist in this moment. Um, and beyond that, that we are thinking about what the city's job is or what government's job is, is not to produce a thing or a widget or whatever, but, um, it, but primarily the, the focus should be supporting the workers who do that, right? Supporting the workers that make the city run. And so what we're seeing right now are just devastating cuts um, to our governmental infrastructure, to our social you know, service uh, infrastructure or social safety nets um, where we're seeing peg after after peg. Um, so we're seeing agencies be cut by, you know, several percentages um, and they aren't able to deliver. The city is currently being sued because HRA cannot administer um, food, food stamp benefits, uh, SNAP benefits in, in a timely manner. And so people are going hungry because of that. That is a failure of government. Uh, and, you know, if we are going to, um, even just on, in a narrow way, think about CUNY, for example, and fully funding CUNY. Well, what does that look like and how do we do it? And how do we do it in a way um, that is true to our values, doesn't leave anybody behind, is not about a scarcity mindset, uh, because actually that paradigm shift and that approach is what makes it more likely that you will win, that we will win, that the collective we um, will win. And so I think you know what's important in the strategy is one, understanding that we have this ginormous budget, but it is still finite. It is a pie, right? That hundred plus billion dollar budget, um, you know, every dollar taken from or added somewhere, like added to CUNY, has to come from somewhere else. Uh, and so the importance of being part of, um, you know, a coalition that goes across issue areas that are rooted in the same core values and saying, we're going to stand, CUNY is going to stand with the libraries, is going to stand with our our public schools is going to stand with our housing justice, um, you know, or organizations going to stand with all of these folks to say no cuts to any of these things, investments rather, right? Doubling down, tripling down in a moment um, where we need it and we know it'll give us the, the, the best public health and public safety outcomes and being unafraid to say where that money has got to come from, where um, there are bloated parts of our budget or there are parts of our budget where there's no accountability shy about naming, you know, NYPD and DOC and Department of Corrections being a, a couple of those agencies that fall um, into, that, into that bucket that we resource year over year, that they blow their budgets year over year and research and evidence shows that they do not produce the best public health and public safety outcomes, but that deeper investments in institutions like CUNY, in our libraries, um, in 
you know, all of these other things um, are, are going to get us the results that we want to see. So I think just everybody being really invested in uh, cross coalitional work um, and figuring out where to plug in. So if I could plug the people's plan as a, a as a place if folks are interested, they are running, um, you know, a comprehensive sort of external campaign around fighting the, the mayor's budget cuts and saying, hey, we demand investments in these different um, areas as like a good place to be organized because we need to be organized on a large scale uh, and and quite frankly make me and my colleagues uncomfortable right like push us um, in a way that that again makes it so that we we have no choice but to be moved into being much more urgent much more powerful in our opposition to the, the current proposed um, the current proposed budget because we need a lot more money across the board and it's been and to your point like agencies like dcwp need um you know ex expanded capacity to do the work that they're doing absolutely thank you and thanks for giving us that overview of, of what's going on with the city because i know sometimes it's hard to figure out what exactly is going on so it's helpful to hear from somebody who's doing that work on the inside um, pivoting us from the budget conversation and thinking about, again, some of the roles of, of unions, uh, we had a question in the uh, Q&A from Morgan uh, saying, how can unions help workers who have part-time or full-time positions at often uh, multiple smaller operations uh, versus national brands? Same question for restaurants within large management groups or hotels that offer worker benefits like paid time off, but have high turnover or quotas for receiving those benefits. So uh, either, I know we have a couple of uh, unionists on the call today, so I don't know if Jeremy, Andrea, Stephanie might want to uh, address that question. Maybe Jeremy, I'll see if you're able to get us started with that question. Could you repeat it? It was a little long, sorry. Sure, uh, two parts here. How can unions help workers who have part-time or full-time positions at often smaller operations versus national brands? Um, and then same question for restaurants within large management groups or hotels that offer worker benefits, but have high turnover or quotas uh, to receive those benefits. Yeah, well, I mean, the fast food industry in the nationwide has some of the highest turnover. Um, I know here in the city in Chipotle, I think, I don't know if it was, I think it was 2019, they had almost 200% turnover rate, um, you know, and we're still, the organizing efforts here are still going on strong. So, you know, definitely don't be discouraged um, just because of that, because that's, you know, that's, a, that's a, an issue that all workers have to face. But I think unions um, can do a lot for these kinds of workers. I think they can do a lot, uh, um, some of the, they can benefit the most because these workers having smaller brand or, or working with smaller brands um, can have more leverage um, with, with getting a better contract. Um, and I, you know, I've seen that myself with, um, in Kentucky, um, I forget the coffee brand, the coffee, the cafe brand, but it had around like 30 stores in the state of Kentucky and they were able to get a contract, get a union election and a contract within like maybe about two years while, um, you know, Starbucks workers are still out fighting, um, to negotiate. Um, so maybe having some often or dealing with a smaller brand in terms of like cafe or, or a small shop can sometimes benefit workers since it makes it easier for them to organize like the whole um, brand or locations. Um, if it's like a franchisee or something like that. Um, so I think honestly, they have the most to benefit from organizing. And I forgot the second part of the question. No, I think that's that's great. Um, uh, I appreciate that overview. Um, and I wanted to uh, pivot us. Um, oh, Andrea, go ahead. Yeah, I want to say one more thing because I realize I don't know the exact names of these programs, but City Tech has a whole culinary arts or some kind of a program. They train students, bring them to kitchens, they become servers, and I don't know what else. I know that Hostos also has some programs that. Um, that uh, work with students to bring them into rest the, re the needs of restaurants in New York City. And, I, you know, there's probably a lot more at CUNY. And I just, um, you know, I, I, I would be curious to know, especially at City Tech, which has a really permanent large program, 
you know, what do they, you know, what are they teaching? How are they helping our students to uh, be treated better, especially in an industry that is pretty brutal, right? So um, I, I, I would be curious for us to find out a little bit more about what they do, not only to train them to be good workers and know what they're doing, but know the politics of the industry that they're getting into, right? And how can they be unionized, right? Some are, but most aren't probably. No, great flag. And again, as Nick mentioned in the chat, we do outline where some of the food education work is happening at CUNY. And I think open question about, you know, uh, what sort of labor education is built into that. But on that question, as we're sort of heading towards the end of our panel today, uh, I wanted to pose this question to both Professor Luce uh, and Andrea, if you'd like to respond as well. Um, but thinking about, again, you know, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, some of these questions about, um, you know, how do I organize in my, you know, shop with tons of turnover? Um, I think, again, this sort of speaks to, um, you know, questions of, you know, educating around organizing and not just here's your rights in the workplace, but here's how to actually make sure that those uh, rights are, you know, respected and effectuated in the workplace. So, I wonder if you could think a little bit about or talk to us about, you know, what's the first step that CUNY can do to proactively make labor education rights um, uh, or labor rights education core in the CUNY curriculum. Uh, I saw you mentioned the union semester program at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, you know, are initiatives like that a starting point? Um, uh, yeah, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, sure. I mean, first of all, CUNY should be free and that <laughs> that would reduce a lot of the stress for food workers that um, are trying to balance their, their school and work life. Um, but second best is uh, expanding the programs that um, uh, do you, like the union semester program here at the School of Labor and Urban Studies. It provides a stipend for workers, uh, for students to work with a union or a workers' rights organization in the day and take classes at night and get credit. CUNY could uh, increase the stipends to do that program, um, and they could increase the number of slots available um, and make it easier for lots, a lot more students to participate in that program. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of CUNY, so it's already part of the CUNY system, but CUNY can make that easier to do. Um, and CUNY could provide actually funding to place students with worker uh, rights organizations that don't have the budgets. Um, what we call worker centers or other kinds of small nonprofits that are, are working on worker rights issues um, and uh, assisting uh, students to, to uh, work with those kinds of organizations to organize. Um, so those are some ideas initially, but um, uh, Andrea, I'll pass it over to you if you have more. Well, you know, I, I know that you know much more about what's happening in the classrooms than I do, but you know, actually my, um, my my CUNY job is at a place called the American Social History Project, which was originally a labor history project um, from the 1980s uh, and, you know, was staffed by some really distinguished historians across the years at CUNY. And I say that because that came out of sort of the 1960s um, movement to diversify and have our classes be more relevant, um, whether it's talking about working people or covering um, sort of gender studies and, and, and uh, ethnic studies, right? All of that came out of a movement. It came out of a demand. And what I am also encouraged about by sort of labor organizing right now is that let's hope there should be a demand. And, and it's great that someone put this in this chat, right? It's true, you probably have to search a lot to find the labor history class that you want right now in the right college, in the right place at the right time, um, you know? Uh, Stephanie pointed out earlier, there's a business school at every college, right? Um, but if students start requesting those colleges and, I, and given what we're seeing around us, right? The organizing that's being done in, you know, in, 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 in fast food, but also on campuses, right? So unions are back, uh, unions are back. And I think that young people expecting and um, wanting those kinds of classes will make a difference. Absolutely. You know, I uh, had a friend who was involved in um, some of the 
uh, strikes that were happening at Rutgers University, not too far from us, uh, just this past week, and was mentioning, you know, seeing all these sorts of undergrads coming out, you know, maybe for the first time taking actions like that, and, and just sort of wondering what that's going to mean for folks as they, you know, move into the workplace, and, and what that's sort of seeing that action in, you know, places of education, what that's going to mean for folks uh, in terms of wanting that, um, you know, taking collective action. Uh, so um, obviously a lot more to be said on that. Um, but in the interest of time, um, I would like to uh, thank all of our panelists for uh, the work that you do and for your comments today. Uh, I think it was really great to you know, get this report in conversation with you all and the excellent work that you all are doing across uh, New York City. So um, thank you again for your time. And uh, I would love to hand things over uh, to Dr. Freudenberg to uh, close us out for today. So Nick, over to you. Great. Well, thank you all so much for being uh, part of this session. And I think there are just a few things to uh, say in closing. I wanted to highlight uh, two points made by our panelists. First, uh, Tiffany's uh, recommendation about building a broad-based coalition. I think that as 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 we've heard, that's how things move forward. And to bring together folks here at CUNY, uh, people who are uh, members of labor organizations, people who are elected officials, to put forward uh, a shared agenda. And the second, for those of us who are at CUNY, whether as students or faculty or staff, I've been a proud member of PSC CUNY for 40 years, and they really take the lead uh, in fighting for CUNY in New York. Uh, and the New Deal for CUNY. And we should all be finding ways both to support their work, but also to inform their work, to bring in the work we're doing in other places of CUNY to make sure that the union knows about that work and can integrate it into its efforts. Uh, I think we need a short-term agenda around the state budget to be set in the next few days and the city budget in the next few weeks. And we need a long-term agenda. And what makes me optimistic is this is our moment, you know, in the uh, 40 or 50 years that I've been observing political activity in the United States, I've never seen such a high level support for unions and unionization, especially here in New York City, especially among the young people that CUNY reached. This is our opportunity to really make uh, CUNY and its historic commitment relevant to the 21st century. And we really invite all of you, we see this the report and this session as a first step. And we really invite all of you to be in touch with each other and also with us so that over the next year, we can really begin to work to make CUNY a national model for connecting our students to labor unions and connecting labor unions to higher education. And we really invite you to read the report, to give us your ideas, to join our future events, and uh, we're so appreciative of your time today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and again, we have a recording of this. So if you have folks in your life who weren't able to join us today, uh, we'll send that out so you can send that to them. Um, lots of great resources in the chat. We invite you to check those out. Um, and again, thank you for joining us today. Like Nick mentioned, this is just round one of uh, many more conversations to come. So appreciate you for joining us today. Thank you again for our panelists and uh, we hope to see you soon. Bye everybody. <laughs>